And my name is Shua Khan. I'm a kernel maintainer and Linux fellow at the Linux Foundation. So today, we are doing something um, exciting. Uh, listening to all of our mentees that graduated last year. We started doing this um, in-person uh, mentorship showcases this year. We did one in Seattle, and then we did uh, one in Hong Kong um, in August, and then uh, another one in Europe, and now we are here for, uh, for Japan. So we have, um, we have uh, kicking this off, deep, Poharkar, um, he is final year uh, st student pursuing bachelor's of technology in information technology. So he'll be talking to us about uh, user experience to code quality, enhancing litmus control. So. so hi, good evening, good evening everyone. My name is Deep, and I'm an LFX mentee. Uh, I was a part of Linux Foundation mentorship program last year. Um, so today I'm here to talk about uh, my Linux Foundation mentorship journey. Uh, but before going to the journey, let me all take you through my introduction. So I'm an open source contributor. I've contributed to different organizations, varying from Intel, which was a cybersecurity company, and then I was also an open source contributor at CNCF, part of which is also Litmus Chaos. And I've also contributed to the National Resource for Network Biology organization. Also, I was LFX mentee last fall at Litmus Chaos, and a Google Summer of Code mentee after that this year. And you can reach me at my mail, or you can just ping me on the LinkedIn or Twitter. So let me all take you through where it all started. To be honest, it all started on a random day while I was scrolling my YouTube. This exact video popped up on my feed, and I was wondering, what is it? A guy here named Kunal Kushwa, I would like to give credit to him because I'm standing here. This video was about open source, and what exactly is open source? I was completely new. I was in my freshman year. and. I did not know what open source the term is. This video introduced me to it and also got to know about different programs, one of them being the LFX, which was the Linux Foundation Mentorship Program. So now I got to know about the program, but I did not know how to apply, how to get in, or how to be there. Um, so I went to the Linux Foundation Mentorship site, and I got to know about that various organizations participate in this and one of them being the CNCF. It was a big, bit prominent one, so I went to their GitHub and saw their repository. There were various, many projects, and one of them caught my eye, and that was Litmus Chaos. So I got to know about Litmus Chaos, and Litmus Chaos is a CNCF incubating project which works on chaos engineering. Chaos engineering was a new term for me, and I started learning about it uh, after I introduced after I got introduced to this organization, and it got really interested me. So I went to the repository and so looked for the good first issues and tried to solve them. While I was solving them, I was uh, posting it on the Slack channel. Due to which I also got to know about the maintenance of the uh, Litmus Chaos, and. I also got to know about the project more, and the community was very, very welcoming, and uh, they were supporting me very much. So then I submitted my proposal, and I got in. But it doesn't stop at getting in, right? So let me all tell you about what work actually I did. My work at the LFX included various things, uh, one of them being uh, revamping the user experience. But wait, this is not the user experience you all think of. This is not the web user experience. It is about the CLI tool user experience. I was mostly working on the Litmus CLI, which was the Litmus CTL, which is a command line interface tool for Litmus Chaos. So I revamped the user interface of that CLI using prompt UI library, and I also wrote unit tests for different functions and uh, worked upon 
worked on different uh, vulnerabilities and dependencies, and one of them being removing the dependency of kubectl, which was a third-party dependency. And lastly, I also helped in packaging the binary to the homebrew. So this is how I completed my LFX, but uh, what was more important was how it changed, how it changed me as a developer. So it actually has a prominent role in making me who I am. As the mentors were very helpful and uh, they had me with me uh, and they got my back every time. So I got, a, I got good at development and uh, reason of that, I also cracked Google Summer of Code after that and I was also part of various hacker house, one of them being the RV India one. So you know that open source opens the door for you, for the, for the opportunities. So you know why to contribute to open source. But you still be like, hey Deep, we know that we, it is good for us to contribute to open source. It opens the door to opportunities, but how? So how is the question I would like to answer within just three simple steps. First one being the finding the organization, finding the correct project for you. The project which interests you, which has a tech stack, which you like to contribute to. Otherwise, you won't be able to contribute forcefully. So after finding the organization, just collaborate with the community. Just collaborate with the community, just talk to the people in the community, what are the challenges they are facing, what do they feel about the uh, code base right now, and what all the changes they need. Start with the contributing to the good first issues, and it'll be all right. Just after contributing, talk to them about the various programs if they are participating in, in any, like LFX or GSOC, and uh, start doing that. So lastly, I would like to thank to my mentors, Sarthak, Nilanjan, and Saranya, uh, for helping me throughout my LFX and uh, becoming me for becoming me what I am. And lastly, I would also like to thank to the Linux Foundation for inviting me and uh, for inviting me to talk at Open Source Summit. Thank you so much. Deep is one of the, uh, we have a, a CNCF runs uh, about 55 or so mentorship programs each year, and Deep is one of our CNCF graduates. Up next is uh, Gurmanath Sohal. Um, she's 21 years old, from studying electrical engineering at IIT Roorkee, and if you're familiar with uh, Indian universities, IITs are very prestigious, like Ivy Leagues in, in the US. So um, she'll be speaking about empowering Kubernetes with Kevadna, fine-grained pod security standards. Gurmanath? OK, here, here. <laughs> Hello, I am Gurmanath Sohal, and uh, I was an LFX mentee last fall uh, in Kaivarno, and my mentor was Ms. Shooting Zhao. And today I'll talk about how Kaivarno is empowering Kubernetes with its pod security standards, and how I worked upon fine graining them. Uh, but first, we must discuss what Kaiverno is. Basically, Kaiverno is a policy management tool, and it automates security and operational policies for the Kubernetes clusters. It is designed for Kubernetes and leverages its native resources. And basically, it works to minimize the risk of unauthorized access by minimizing the attack surfaces. So what did I do? Uh, initially, Kaiverno, in its uh, earlier version, had already supported the validate.pod security rule. It was an exclusion, exclusion rule, and uh, as you can see here in the first code, uh, in version 1.8.0, we had the validate.pod security rule, and exclu it excluded the whole control names. Uh, in this example here, the host path volumes, the whole host path volumes was being excluded. So. I worked on introducing a finer grained exclusion for this specific uh, uh, pod security standard by introducing a restricted fields column. So here we have introduced a new restricted field and 
a particular field with particular values is now used to exclude uh, a specific policy. I also worked upon uh, writing tests for the functions and on migrating tests from Cuttle to Chainsaw. This change was essential because it resulted in a smoother and more efficient testing process. Uh, as it might be evident, the problem was that uh, the port security standards were not uh, fine-grained enough and lack the granularity which complex, complex use cases usually need. So the solution was fine-graining fine them and enhancing their precision and flexibility. Uh, uh, working on these, working for these three months, uh, I encountered Kubernetes and uh, it was my first time working with Kubernetes and uh, it helped me gain very good insights. And uh, also I learned the importance of testing and CI optimi optimization. I hadn't worked on CI optimizations as well, and it added to my knowledge. And of course it added to my col uh, collaboration in open source as well. I have been uh, collaborating in open source in various organizations, so it was a really great experience. So thank you so much, and here I have a few links if Anybody would like to <laughs> get in touch? Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we next up is US Nine. It will be talking about see the our mentees work on so many different projects and some of them I don't know some the stuff that you are doing, so it's it's exciting. Um, performance analysis and benchmarking of BESU using Caliper with complex workloads. So hey guys, my name is Suyash, I'm 21 years old, and this was my project with uh, Hyperledger Foundation. Uh, here's a small introduction about me. I'm currently in the senior year of my computer science degree, and some of my previ uh, previous experiences include uh, two internships with uh, two different YC startups, an internship at Google where I worked on the Chromium browser, and this LFX mentorship. So here were some of the objectives we had for this internship. The first one was to benchmark Besu's performance across private networks using Caliper. So Besu has three private networks, which are QBFT, IBFT, and Click. And Caliper is basically Hyperledger's benchmarking tool, which you can use to benchmark Hyperledger Fabric and Hyperledger Besu. The next objective was to extend Caliper to support complex Ethereum workloads. Uh, we'll get into what workloads are in the next slide. Uh, the third goal was to identify and optimize all of the bottlenecks that we find during our benchmarking runs, and then use them to optimize Besu. And the duration of my internship was for six months. So the first three months, uh, it involved me writing adapters and workloads for smart contracts like ERC-20, ERC-721, and ERC-1155, and two protocols, which were Uniswap and the MakerDAO. So adapters are basically when you deploy a smart contract on the blockchain, you can interact with that smart contract using various functions inside that sm Solidity smart contract. So to benchmark those smart, smart contracts on a particular cha chain, uh, you write adapters for them, so you can call them via Caliper. So that's basically what an adapter is. And in this PR, we have added support for ERC-20 and ERC-721 to Caliper. Uh, and this was a testing environment set up for the internship. So for benchmarking, we had basically two goals. We wanted our environment to be reproducible, and we wanted the numbers that we were collecting to be largely accurate. So for this, I was provisioned with five Linux virtual machines, out of which on four of them, I was running Besu virtual machines that are connected to each other. And on one of them, I was running Caliper, uh, a Caliper virtual machine to send transactions to these Besu nodes. And as you can see, all of these Besu nodes are connected back to my system to collect metrics. So moving on to the metrics part, why metrics matter? So we get accurate insights into the network's performance. So we are able to collect data on things like the transactions per second happening on the blockchain, the memory usage, the network's latency, and other interesting stuff like that. And also we get access to continuous monitoring on the chain. So we can ensure that during uh, one of our benchmarking runs, none of the nodes falter or something like that. So some of the tools we use for metric collections, we use Prometheus for collecting real-time data on things like CPU usage, on memory, on latency, and on transactions per second, as I mentioned earlier. 
We use Grafana for visualizing the collected metrics and analyzing performance trends and also identifying performance issues over time. And then we use Async Profiler for code profiling and flame, flame graph generation. So this is one of the flame graphs that we were looking into during the internship. And this basically tells us uh, where the code is inefficient and how we can optimize it. And all of the red blobs on it are the hotspots which need optimization. And this is just one of the Grafana dashboards that we had set up. So the last three months, um, here's a small example of applying our learnings and our findings that we found uh, during, during, uh, during our benchmarking runs. So this PR improved our transaction processing in Besu by around 61%. And um, as you can see here in the before, the, the, red, uh, the red line that you see on the graph, it's for the get pulled, opt uh, get pulled transactions from peer method. And at its peak, it was being called around uh, 1.8 times per second. And the task sum for it kept increasing. So, uh, so how we fix this? Um, the, the task sum here is basically the amount of uh, processing time taken up by this method. So after our PR, on the same benchmarking run, you can see that the average number of calls per second to this method dropped by a lot. Uh, before, it was around 1.8, and now it's around 0 0.7. And the task sum for it keeps decreasing as well. So yeah, that was just a small example. And some of, uh, some of the learnings and takeaways that I had from this internship, I gained a lot of experience in setting up distributed blockchain nodes and private networks. Uh, I gained an in-depth understanding of the Ethereum virtual machine, so how the protocol layer, how the protocol layer works, how the consensus layer works, and how they interact with each, with each other. I learned Ethereum protocol development. I also learned how to do effective performance benchmarking and monitoring. And I also learned a lot about collaborative open source development. And yeah, I'm grateful to the Linux Foundation for this opportunity, and a special thanks to my mentors, Nishil, George, and Christian for, for helping me throughout my mentorship. And yeah, you can reach me at this if you're interested. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so next up is uh, um, the talk is navigating large code base while keeping your sanity. Uh, Sanjay Kumar. You're also in the final year, I, I guess? Yes. Yes. See you. Hello, everyone. My name is Sanjay. I'm an LFX graduate. And today my talk is about, talk is a little different from others. Uh, today I want to talk about navigating large code bases while keeping your sanity. Just a bit about myself. Uh, I'm a final year computer, uh, computer science undergraduate based in Mumbai. And I have worked with multiple startups from uh, San Francisco, Europe, and Bangalore. Uh, I'm also I've also uh, uh, done a, a LFX mentorship uh, previous year uh, under CNCF uh, uh, at no Notary Project. Uh, I've also launched my own SaaS uh, application, which is Timestamper AI, uh, which currently has more than 160 customers. Uh, so today's agenda, I want to talk, uh, so mainly my presentation presentation is all about my learnings and uh, things that I've picked up which, which were really useful for me. So the agendas are navigating large code, code bases with efficiently, making low risk uh, code changes, avoid pitfalls with legacy codes, leveraging AI tools for faster coding understanding. Starting with documentation, People might be wondering, so we can use documentation, right, via for understanding code bases. Yeah, I mean, we can use co code bases, but uh, we can use uh, documentations, but uh, it's not always perfect for us, uh, for uh, unique individuals. Uh, so, uh, so going on to the next one. Uh, so things that will that would work in case if the documentation is not perfect or not good. Uh, starting off with strategy, uh, knowing what the application does. What worked for me is that first I do what I do is I do I run my code code base or I set up the code, uh, and I observe what the application does in general. Uh, I explore what is what hap what what is happening with the uh, functionalities and many other things. It gives me clarity on what what function is uh, uh, related to uh, each other and how they communicate with each, each other. Going on to the next one, Inten intentionally breaking things and making sense of it. Now, uh, for me, 
I the reason why I uh, intentionally break things is because uh, uh, it provides a clear breakage and errors that, uh, on what uh, what what is going on exactly in the code base, and it, it gives me it gives me a platform where I can analyze what is uh, how each function are inter interconnected with each other, and I can basically build a mental map of that code base uh, for the given code base that I am using. Going on to the next one. Landing a low effort code change quickly. Code change quickly. Now I am emphasizing on the landing a low effort code, and the reason why I am saying is this because every single repository has this has its own code log, uh, check logs, and quality checks, and uh, uh, providing a PR uh, pull request with a much more uh, smaller code, ch code change is, uh, is is much more efficient than. Uh, uh, providing a uh, then uh, making a uh, pull request uh, with a large change uh, because we have to deal with unexpected issues with a large code uh, code code changes as compared to small code changes and it's also a quick uh, it's also a good validation for us for who is uh, new to that code base going on to the next one identifying leg legacy code files now this is very important for the people who are very new to the code base and uh, for the people who don't know, who aren't familiar with legacy code, basically these codes, this code, uh, these are code files and folders which are not updated for months or probably years. So most, most probably you, you don't have to work on that uh, legacy code unless it's it's the part, it's a, it's a part of your job. So going on to the next one, uh, ask questions. So. It's very common for uh, software engineers to to be stuck at uh, while uh, understanding a code base. So it's probably uh, good to ask directly to the maintainers or the builders of that uh, repository. Uh, we can easily access the communication platforms, uh, which will be probably they have linked in their uh, README bio, uh, like uh, Discord servers, Slacks, and GitHub dis uh, discussions. But it's also important to uh, know that uh, you should also ensure that you have you made a, a genuine effort to solve the issue on your own. Uh, so you you don't have to ask a very simple simple questions to the maintainers because they are they were they are probably also doing their own job with with uh, with the uh, with maintaining a, a open source co uh, codes code base. So uh, last option. Uh, AI tools. Uh, now, back when when I was uh, doing uh, my internship uh, at LFX uh, in CN CNCF project, I didn't had the uh, I didn't had the accessibility of uh, advanced AI as compared to what we have now. So I would say uh, using AI is is the probably the, uh, is probably the best way to navigate large code bases, uh, uh, and uh, the reason is uh, it reduces the time to required for understanding the code base. Uh, in much more easier format, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, co uh, AI tools such as uh, AI tools, AI tools such as uh, uh, Cursor AI and uh, GitHub Copilot co are one of uh, th those my recommendations. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sanjay. So that's, I think that we have uh, four graduates. Um, so congratulations. Thank you for coming to present and talk to us about the, your experience and the projects. And thanks, everybody, for participating and learning, what, learning about what they have done in their last year. CNCF, I think, covered now, and mostly yes. So thank you so much. Hello, my name is Thibaut Batale, and last fall, 2023, I was part of the Linux Foundation Mentorship Program under the CNCF project Litmus Chaos. To better understand what is Litmus Chaos, let's picture this small scenario. So you have your platform that has to handle daily transactions, and during the Black Friday, the number of transactions is twice higher comparing to normal days. 
as an engineer, what you want to do is ensure that your platform is able to handle that sudden increase of tra transaction during that day. That's where Litmus Chaos comes in. Litmus Chaos allows you to test your application into a simulated environment in order to identify bottleneck and weaknesses from your platform. So one common example is to simulate a node failure environment to see if your application is able to handle that, uh, that case and if there won't be any downtime for your users. My work for Litmus Chaos was split in three parts. So first of all was writing test case for the authentication server, uh, writing test case for the UI component and uh, incorporating a new API documentation. For writing test case for the authentication server, there was three different uh, th three different steps. So the first step was to first of all convert every function to an interface layer and then use them for for creating a mock client so i had to create a grpc mock client and a rest api, REST API mock client so those mock clients were now being used on step three where i created a new instance from each services and now wrote test cases for different scenarios with um, some mock data and different type of acceptation in order to test uh, every single component for the authentication server. So one, the main ideology behind that is to test every component into a single isolated environment. And that, and that same ideology is also being applied for testing UI component where here I'm using a test wrapper in order to mock external dependencies like the React query provider, the Apollo client, and uh, also internal dependencies. And after that, the last step, which is to write test cases, uh, different test cases, uh, trying to simulate different scenario. All right, regarding my last work was to incorporating a new API documentation. For that, I use Swago and wrote, a, and wrote different markers for every single API which included a response schema and a request schema also and after that at the end of the journey i was able to register about 34 rest endpoints and uh, also one of my main accomplishments was to increase uh, the test coverage for the back end to 25 percent and also improve the test coverage to 14 percent One thing that I learned during my journey is uh, the importance of testing. I will say before pa being part of this program, I had some kind of bias thought of uh, testing. And uh, yeah, right now, uh, even though testing will take more time into your development journey, I believe that it saves actually a lot of time from uh, in the future. So this is a, real, a huge thought that kind of like a new way of thinking that I currently have. And even right now, I would say it's even better to even write test cases before even writing the software that you want. So that's it. And I would also like to thank my mentors, Jenna and Mondal, who actually were always there to review my pull requests, giving me feedback on that. And also thank other maintainers who also gave me some great feedback when I was having issues with uh, testing some uh, component on the authentication server. If you want to join our community, we have uh, we are running uh, meetings every third Friday of the month. You can just uh, go, we have you can just join our Slack channel. The link, uh, the Zoom link is usually being dropped there and just join one of our meetings. If you want to get started, you will learn more about uh, what uh, other contrib contributors worked on and uh, what is uh, what are the different projects of Litmus Chaos right now. We have multiple projects like a CLI tool and multiple other, other projects. So that's it. And thank you for listening to me and feel free to connect to me uh, with me on LinkedIn, GitHub, anywhere you, anywhere you like.
and that's it thank you